Today we're going to talk about non-circular orbits and how we can explain what's going on with both energy and angular momentum. We're going to start by looking at four simulated orbital paths or the orbital motion that four different things undergo as they orbit, in this case, let's say a planet. In this simulation, this little purple dot is going to represent a satellite or a moon, something that's going to move in a, some kind of path around the planet. This simulation approximates the gravitational attraction at a given distance and it's going to give it some initial velocity and we'll find out what do these orbital paths actually look like. So I want you to observe the orbital motion that each of these satellites undergo as they orbit the planet and I want you to try to identify any pattern that you can find that is consistent for all of the orbits shown in this video. Watch it again. You should be able to notice that in the lower left hand corner this orbit essentially is a circular orbit and this is consistent with what we've discussed previously which we called uniform circular motion where the speed or the orbital speed or the tangential velocity of the thing orbiting the planet our little satellite here stays the same and it maintains a constant radius of curvature. And so the satellite doesn't get closer to or farther away from the planet. The other three examples are uh, all examples of elliptical orbits. And other than the radius of curvature changing, you should also realize or notice that the orbital speed is changing. If we look in the upper right hand corner, this one seems to show the greatest change in speed. When it's farthest away, it's moving really slow. And notice as it gets closer to the planet, it's increasing speed. So from this position, where it's far out, as it gets closer, the speed gets greater and greater and greater. And as soon as it gets farther from the planet, it slows down. So the orbital speed is changing as the radial distance changes. So the question that we need to try to answer is, how can we explain this? When in this case, let's say a moon is far away from a planet, it's moving slow. And when the moon is closest to the planet, it's moving its fastest. So why do objects in elliptical orbits increase their speed when they get closer to the object they orbit? And vice versa, why do they decrease their speed as they get farther from the object that they orbit? Well, we're first going to try to answer this question considering our planet moon system using energy ideas and energy conservation. So we're going to define the system as both the planet and the moon. Let's take the farthest position the moon is from the planet and let's call that position A. And the closest position the moon is to the planet we'll call that position B. So at position A it's moving the slowest and position B it's moving the fastest just like we saw in our simulated orbital motion. So let's make an energy bar graph for the energy stored by the system at position A. Remember, our system is both the planet and the moon combined. Our system at position A has kinetic energy because the moon is in motion. It's moving. It has translational velocity. So let's say it has two bars of kinetic energy. What about gravitational potential energy? We have a mass that's at some height above the planet, and so any time you have a mass separated from an object that's gravitationally attracting it, the planet and the object separated will have gravitational potential energy. And we're going to define the system to have zero gravitational potential energy when R is zero. If the moon was essentially the center of the mass of the moon was at the center of the mass of the planet. So at position A, R is not zero the moon is some height above the planet and so it's going to have some gravitational potential energy. And it's far away so let's say there's four bars of gravitational potential energy. So there's no springs involved and so we just have the kinetic energy plus the gravitational energy at position A. Is there any energy transferred into the system or out of the system as the moon goes through its elliptical path? Well if we consider the system to be the planet and the moon and we're going to assume there's no outside forces for s just to simplify things on the planet and the moon system that means there's no work being done so 
There's no energy transferred into the system or out of the system. So let's look at position B. Where is the energy stored by the planet moon system? Well, at position B, it's moving faster than it was at position A, so it's got kinetic energy and it has to have more kinetic energy. Let's say there's four bars of kinetic energy. And at position B, does it have any gravitational potential energy? Well, sure. It's not at a height of zero, it's still above the planet, but it's closer to the planet, and so it has, has to have less gravitational potential energy. If you go back to position A, we have six bars of total energy, and so in the end, if there's no work being done, there has to be six bars of total energy in the end. So if we have four bars of energy in the kinetic energy account, we have to have two bars of energy in the gravitational potential energy account. So an energy conservation equation looks like this. The kinetic energy of the system at A plus the gravitational potential energy at system A is equal to the kinetic energy at position B plus the gravitational potential energy at position B. This is our energy conservation equation. So if we were to graph, first of all, let's say the total energy of the system, what's true? Well, remember, there's no work being done, so the total energy of the system the planet and the moon system throughout its whole orbit has to stay constant. So we just have a flat horizontal line. At any position, whether it's at when it's reached position B, or reached position A, or gone back to position B, here we've got an energy versus time graph, the total energy of the system has to stay the same. But what if we graph the kinetic energy of the system? Let's say at our first time, the time when it's at position B, well, when it's at position B, it's moving the fastest, so it should have the most kinetic energy. By the time it makes it to position A, it's going to be moving the slowest, so it should have the least kinetic energy, and then it should go back and forth. So it should go from highest kinetic energy to lowest kinetic energy to highest kinetic energy to lowest kinetic energy, and it'll look something like this. It's going to vary back and forth from the highest to the lowest kinetic energy. Well, what about the gravitational potential energy of the system? At position B, is it at its highest or its lowest? Well, at position B, it's the closest, so therefore it must store the least gravitational potential energy. And at position A, it's the farthest from the planet, or it's the highest off of its, from the center of its mass, and so it's going to have the greatest gravitational potential energy. So if we were to graph the gravitational potential energy, it's going to vary like this highest at position A, lowest at position B, and kind of cycle back and forth. If we were to add the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy of the system, the sum of those two things should stay constant because there's no work being done. So let's answer our question. Why does the planet move the fastest when it's closest? because it has the least gravitational potential energy, and so it must have the highest kinetic energy. When it's farthest away, it has more gravitational potential energy, so its kinetic energy has to go down because the total energy of our system, the planet-moon system, stays constant. So that's one way to explain why the moon is moving the fastest when it's the closest to the planet, and it's moving the slowest when it's farthest away from the planet. Just think about energy conservation. Let's try to see if we can explain it another way using our new concept of angular momentum that we've introduced in this unit. In this case, we're just going to consider the system to be the moon only, not the moon and planet system combined. So the question is, Throughout its orbit, is the moon changing its angular momentum? Is the angular momentum increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Well, remember, we have an equation to help us think about when something or a system of things change their angular momentum. It's this. The change in L, or the change in angular momentum, is equal to the outside torque that the object experiences multiplied by time. and the outside torque, or torque, is calculated by a radial distance times an applied force multiplied by time. And as long as the radial distance and the applied force are perpendicular to one another, we just multiply them together. And if not, we have to use this full expression, r times f times the sine of theta, where theta is the angle between 
both R and F. So let's go to the moon in this position up here and find out is there a torque that the moon experiences at the instant it's at this point in the orbit. Well, here's our radial distance between the planet and the moon. What direction is the force? Well, does the moon feel a force at this point? Well, yeah, it's being gravitationally attracted towards the center of the planet. So the moon is experiencing a gravitational force directed towards the center of the planet. And the question is, uh, does this force exert a torque on the moon at this instant in time? Well, there is a radial distance. It is feeling a force. But what's the angle between R and F? Notice that the radial distance and the applied force on the moon, they're parallel to one another. So theta is 0. So if these two things are parallel, the force of gravity and R, theta is 0, that means this gravitational force doesn't exert any torque on the moon. And if there's no torque exerted on the moon, doesn't matter how much time it experiences that, there's no change in angular momentum. The angular momentum is not changing at this instant. Well, let's look at the other positions of the moon as it orbits the planet. Okay, we I've drawn in a radial distance for each and the direction that the uh, gravitational attraction is on the moon directed towards the center of the planet. <clears throat> and we can see that in all of these cases, the gravitational attraction or the gravitational force the moon feels is always going to be parallel to the radial distance. That means no matter where the moon is, this statement will always be true. There's no torque exerted on the moon. So therefore, the moon does not change its angular momentum. We'd see that the angular momentum of the moon is conserved even throughout this elliptical orbit where the radial distance is changing and the velocities are changing. So let's see if we can use some equations to help us think about this a little bit more <clears throat> to answer our question. Angular momentum is conserved. <clears throat> How does that help us explain why the velocity is the fastest when it's closest and the slowest when it's farthest away? Well, if angular momentum is conserved, then this has to be true. <clears throat> the angular momentum that the moon has at position B when it's the closest has to be the same as the angular momentum the moon has at position A when it's the farthest away. We can get the angular momentum equivalent from a linear momentum by multiplying the linear momentum times its orbital radial distance. So R times P is the same thing as angular momentum. So that means at position B, the distance that the moon is times its linear momentum at position B has to be equal to the radial distance that the moon is at position A times its linear momentum at that position. Linear momentum is just m times v, and so we get rb times m times vb equals the radial distance at A times the planet's mass, or sorry, times the moon's mass times its velocity. And the moon's not changing its mass, whether it's at position B or position A, and so m ends up canceling, and we get this final expression that the radial distance at B times its speed is equal to the radial distance at A times its speed. So we can use this final result to answer our question. Why when the planet is the closest is it moving the fastest and when it's the farthest away it's moving the slowest? Well if the product of R and V have to be equal to one another when at B R is really small the velocity has to be big. And at position A, when r is really far or really large, the velocity has to be smaller. And this is a consequence of the fact that angular momentum is conserved for the moon or any orbiting object. So let's look at one sample AP question together. A moon is in an elliptical orbit about a planet as shown above. At point A, the moon has speed VA and is at distance RA from the planet. At point B, the moon has speed VB. Which of the following explains a correct method for determining the distance of the moon from the planet at point B in terms of the given quantities? So I want you to think about what we just derived to answer this question. We derived this equation, which shows that the product of the orbital 
distance times its speed has to be the same no matter where you are in the orbit. And so we could solve this if we get this equation. Well, where did this equation come from? This came from the fact that the angular momentum at any position in the orbit stayed the same. And how do we know that the angular momentum didn't change, that the change in angular momentum was zero? Well, it came back to the idea of that there was no torque on the moon. And why was there no torque? Because the force and the radial distance were parallel to one another. And so the answer is B. We could determine the distance of the moon from the planet at position B, or point B, assuming conservation of angular momentum. And why is angular momentum conserved? Because the gravitational force exerted on the moon is always directed towards the planet.